Good evening. Chorus from the Rocks by T.S. Eliot. The eagle soars in the summit of heaven. The hunter with his dogs pursues his circuit. O oh, perpetual revolution of configured stars. O oh, perpetual recurrence of determined seasons. O oh, world of spring and autumn, birth and dying. The endless cycle of idea and action, endless invention, endless experiment, brings knowledge of motion, but not of stillness. Knowledge of speech, but not of silence. Knowledge of words, and ignorance of the word. All our knowledge brings us nearer to our ignorance. All our ignorance brings us nearer to death. But nearer, nearness to death, no nearer to God. Where is the life we have lost in living? Where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge we have lost in information? The cycles of heaven in 20 centuries bring us farther from God and nearer to the dust. Second chorus. What life have you if you have not life together? There is no life that is not in community, and no community not lived in praise of God. Even the anchorite who meditates alone for whom the days and nights repeat the praise of God, praise for the church, the body of Christ incarnate. And now you live dispersed on ribbon roads, and no man knows or cares who is his neighbor, unless his neighbor makes too much disturbance. But all dash to and fro in motor cars, familiar with the roads and settled nowhere, nor does the family even move about together but every son would have his motorcycle and daughters ride away on casual pillions. Much to cast down, much to build, much to restore. Let not the work delay, time and the arm not waste. Let the clay be dug from the pit. Let the saw cut the stone. Let fire not be quenched in the forge. Third chorus. O oh, weariness of men who turn from God to the grandeur of your mind and the glory of your action, to arts and inventions and daring enterprises, to schemes of human greatness thoroughly discredited, binding the earth and water to your service, exploiting the seas and developing the mountains, dividing the stars into common and preferred, engaged in devising the perfect refrigerator, engaged in working out a rational morality, engaged in printing as many books as possible, plotting of happiness and flinging empty bottles, turning from your vacancy to fevered enthusiasm for nation or race or what you call humanity, though you forget the way to the temple. There is one who remembers the way to your door. Fourth chorus. Men, polish your teeth on rising and retiring. Women, polish your fingernails. You polish the tooth of the dog and the talon of the cat. Why should men love the church? Why should they love her laws? She tells them of life and death and of all that they would forget. She is tender where they would be hard and hard where they like to be soft. She tells them of evil and sin and other unpleasant facts. They constantly try to escape from the darkness outside and within by dreaming of systems so perfect that no one will need to be good. But the man that is will shadow the man that pretends to be.
Sources of the Raw White Years Alien was read by Tony Hendra. Thank you, Tony, wherever you are. Seeing or hearing that Tony was going to be here and read to us that I'd have a chance to say hello, I suddenly realized what would be a good theme for my presentation. <coughs> and it is one scripture passage. which I have here. My brother Esau is a hairy man, but I am a smooth man. My brother Esau is a hairy man, but I am the smooth. That is the passage. upon which I should pay my talk this evening. In an attempt to explain why we chose the theme for this year that we chose, which is the task given to me. Father Giussani used to say that my participation in his charism consisted in my ability to vulgarize his teachings So I am a holdout whenever the titles appear a little bit difficult. Because frankly, what the heck is the time of the person? And what does it have to do with the time of the people? Well, it's all found in my brother Esau is a hairy man, but I am a smooth man. The time of the person. You are here tonight, and I venture to say that for you, for me, for all of us here, something is worrying us. I mean beyond the usual worries of getting through the day. There is a deeper, a deeper unrest, that's the, the word, an unrest. With it, we seek a source that will restore a direction that, give, that will give a clarity, that will guide us through this unrest. Father Giussani describes the unrest in these words. <coughs> when the grip of a hostile society tightens around us to the point of threatening the vivacity of our expression, and when a cultural and social hegemony tends to penetrate the heart, Stirring up our already natural uncertainties. I love that, uh, that term, natural uncertainties. Then, when that happens, he says, the time of the person has come. 
It's an amazing thing. I don't think the description of the cultural instability is difficult to find or to confirm. Because we're hiding somewhere under the water and the sea, just in the air to breathe. There is this search. If, we, if satisfaction has been found in looking for the source of guidance, stability, vision, wisdom, if satisfaction has been found and we adhere to a particular plan of thought, an ideology even, but, no, but in the best sense, not only in the bad sense of the word. The ideology of modern modernity, for example, we, we find that this hanging on to the to this way of thinking as a way of living decently our humanity and yet at the same time the dissatisfaction it's a tension that I find in my own life to be sometimes intolerable if this gains becomes not only a private way of thinking, but if a whole society, a whole culture is built on this uncertainty, then we've got a problem. What to do about it? Well, some people suggest to attempt to escape from this situation of a ruling uncertainty. I don't know where they intend to escape to, but I can sympathize with the desire to just hide some place. That's why I love those sounds which speak of, a, of being taken up to a mountain by some bird or other and being protected there from the raging seas by some eagle or something like that. I find that protection comforting, but I don't find it in my daily life. So I don't think escape is the solution. As far as Christians are concerned. I remember a few years ago when some evangelical Christian leader, oh, and there was a, like even a big article, perhaps even a cover article in Time or Newsweek and all that kind of stuff, in which he advocated he had a huge following like this, what later became mega churches advocated that the it was time for the Christians to withdraw from American society. Start our own schools, our own hospitals, etc. And there was a, a big discussion about that. But Father Giussani's response to this cultural situation is not that. In fact, it is a very opposite of a disengagement and escape. On the other hand, there is the opposite. Stay and fight. All the way from through legal weapons to actual weapons as we have seen too, even in the name of Christ. 
Well, that too, of course, is rejected by Khalid Jusani. What then to do? Not escape, not stay in order to fight it? What do we do? We come resigned to it? And that, by the way, is another, another response embraced by other people. Who cares, you know? You're resigned to it. Oh, it's all hopeless. So it's all hopeless, or let's fight for it, or let's run away from it. None of those are responses. Here this weekend, in the New York encounter, we will have not many lectures about this, but many witnessing to what many people have done in response to this cultural situation. The time of the person. Let's look at it this way. What this way of thinking, where it is, where it springs from, where our cultural vision and action spring from, is the experience of our awareness of being a person, of being that is someone and not just something. We, if we are someone, we are also something. So that's no problem. The problem is, how does one move from being just something to someone? I don't know whether it is that easy to, to give a theoretical answer to that. But I cannot, I refuse, even in the circles of utmost uncertainty, I refuse to acknowledge someone who says definitely that he or she is just something, and that there are no things like some ones. I've never met such a person. Oh, it may be covered up by many confusing ways of thinking and speaking, but it's there. The unrest is there. And as you begin to move your heart to that point, where the source of this culture and of any culture is born, the being someone. As you move to that, the unrest increases. And I know many people, and I really mean many, who have begun the path, the pilgrimage, to that ground zero. And as they approach, they get more and more scared and just drop the, the path, just drop it. 
and start talking. I, I, we used to attend meetings, friends of mine, to discuss this situation, to try to appreciate, in, in a way it was the other way around, to try to appreciate the positive ways which the modern culture teaches, teaches us. And we could start with that, there's no problem. In fact, one prefers that to start with depressing things. Oh, it is all fruitless, we are all thinking. No, forget it. It's good to start with, you know, one thing that I admire today, uh, however, how falsely it is pursued is the insistence on freedom, for example. Insistence on freedom for a long time in the history of humankind didn't even concern anyone. That's a, a progress made because the experience of freedom lies at the very heart that we are looking for at the very source of our personal. Only persons are free. If there is freedom, only persons are free. So you can start an exploration, a dialogue, uh, with the question of freedom, and if you start positively, there's no problem. We can continue. And yet, we used to do that and were able to actually begin to approach the mystery with capital M. The mystery where this is found within which this point this opening to personal is found. And as we approach that point, suddenly someone would say, let's get Chinese food. <laughs> I love Chinese food. I would rather have it sitting down having some of it right now, actually. <laughs> but you know, it's even funny. It's so... <laughs> it's even funny. But they're not aware that it's funny. What does the... When you say I am a person, I am free or I want to be free, I have these rights, what, to what experience are you giving this his name to. What is it that has touched you? I would propose to you, Padre Giussani would answer, that what has touched you is the experience of someone else, of an other with capital O, that is open up or opens up to have a relationship with you. As we, as we are filled up with the life of this other, we experience our personal as stronger and stronger. You may be lying down in your deathbed, weak from all, all perspectives in your body, and yet, inside, you may be stronger than ever. Look, I have not, I haven't 
I'm working on my canonization, but, <laughs> but I haven't been yet anyway. I'm not talking about, I am not asking you to, to be spiritual about this. We are talking about human experiences. If we just look at them in order to see what the stuff of personal is made of, and we grab it and allow ourselves to be fulfilled by it and love it, to that degree we are strong, strong to resist the other ideologies. Because what the others attack is the experience of being a person. The response is simple. Well, let's be a person. Let's give the witness of what a person is like. To everyone, without any running away or any invasion or anything. The testimony. This has happened to me. You can tell in the person's face and eyes and gestures that something has happened. That is what Valentine says. This is the time of the person. And we have devoted this weekend to examples of what it means to live in the time of the person. It's a relationship experience. It is a relationship of belonging to a reality that unites all. And it is in the experience of that belonging to this common reality that we find the birth of a people. And so that's the meaning, I think, that's how I see it, of the text of the exhibit this weekend. Now, I'm told that there are only two minutes left. Look at the size of this talk. <laughs> I can see. <laughs> Since I have two minutes, I have passed the two minutes. <laughs> Lovely to make them wait. <laughs> My brother he saw is a hairy man. But I am a smooth man. Well, now let me tell you how this is related to T.S. Eliot and therefore to the theme of our to the theme of our presentation this weekend. I have a dear friend who was for many, many years, like my sister, she was a secretary who lives, who is from England and lives, uh, lives there. She was married and I, we agreed that she would go and after a respectable time poison her husband and then come back with money. But <laughs> she hasn't. The brother Esau is a hairy man's sketch was one of Alan Bennett's monologue. Take a Pew was the title of it. From Beyond the Fringe was the name of the comedy show. There were four main performers, Peter Cook, Jonathan Miller, Dudley Moore, and Alan Bennett. They formed the group when they were at the University of Cambridge. I saw it, she says, in New York in 1964. Alan Bennett was a few years ahead of me in the youth club of St. Michael's Church in Headingley, Leeds. And the Take a Pew sketch must have been based on the sermons of the vicar 
which he regularly graved, as the structure was just the same. I'm sure we typed it up once. You must have it someplace. The link with T.S. Eliot is that the parents of his wife, Valerie, this is T.S. Eliot's wife, the parents of his wife, think that was her name, she thinks. The parents live just up the road from Alan's father's butcher's shop, the father of Alan Bennett, who is the one who gives the sermon in this show, was a butcher. Supposedly, and this is written in one of Bennett's books, one day his mother, who was a very ordinary lady, came home and said she was just been talking to Valerie's mother and she had a rather shabby looking man with her. Alan Bennett immediately knew that it was T.S. Eliot, but didn't know it would mean a thing to his mother. But she was impressed. So, there you have it. And why, why Mr. Hendricks, because he was involved in this. He probably wrote the line. Ali Jusani, last quote. The measure of faith is humor. Ali Jusani. So in his name, we have ended with this little attempt to humor and remind you, when the culture seems to overwhelm you, remember, Esau was a hairy man. <laughs> But they're smooth men. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, if I can find my way around, I'll introduce you to the two people who are going to follow the act. Here we go. First, first is, I guess, Padre Samir, you're coming on for it. He is not afraid to confess that he is a Jesuit. <laughs> These days, Jesuits have gained in popularity. <laughs> one of the greatest, <laughs> it says one of the greatest living experts on the relationship between Christians and Muslim. We were going to invite one of the one of the dead experts. <laughs> but he couldn't come. <laughs> but above all he is a man of profound faith and love for the people, my man, from all religious backgrounds, living in that wounded, truly wounded and suffering part of the world that is the Middle East. He will have some pregnant stories to share with us. Well, good evening. Uh, I am Den Samir, born in Cairo, Egypt, and working in mainly in Lebanon now, but also teaching in different European countries. I would like to tell you something about my experience with uh, Muslims, friends, and with Muslims in general. Since the, yeah, in Egypt, we are around 10 percent and 90 percent Muslims. We are the original community. You know that the word Copts, to say Christians of Egypt, is pronounced in Arabic Gipti, which comes from Egypti, Egyptians. So we, we know we are 
the Egyptians and the Muslims came in the 7th century and later on and joined us but they, be they became the majority this feeling uh, we think we are all Egyptians first the Christians then the Muslims and we are a family we lived like that often not always we had also hard times sometimes in the Middle Ages in the 14th 15th century and in the modern times uh, since the 60s it's becoming difficult for Christians more difficult than than it was before that but the question is God put us in this country and the Muslims came and we are one nation one family the question is why are we here do we have a mission certainly if we are believers we have certainly a mission God put us in this country to be testimonies of the gospel middle uh, our brothers Muslims personally I had uh, usually very positive experiences with the Muslims I give you some uh, examples of what I lived in the 70s mm, I, I started working in Upper Egypt that means in the south in, in villages um, to, to develop the country socially and uh, at the education level we were a group of Christians very much involved in, in this work in Upper Egypt young people at that time I was young and uh, I was the, the oldest one more or less one friend was Muslim and he wanted to work with us and I remember we were going to the very south of Egypt around 10 hours uh, with a pickup it was a hard day and we had we were 12 persons and we had conflicts between us human conflicts and personalities which were not uh, perfectly in, um, in accord with each other and at midnight we were almost we reached almost Akhmim, the, the village where we were going to my friend Mahmoud the Muslim came from behind the pickup I was in the front and he says Father Samir I think we had a hard day today uh, with a lot of conflicts I think we need to pray together I said well it's beautiful why not yes I I ask you when we arrived I suggest that we celebrate mass and he was the only Muslim and I said but you know it's midnight and we still have half an hour do you think we are ready for that ask the others so he said to in the pickup um, he repeated and said I propose that we pray together and we celebrate mass and they said okay and we make a reconciliation Ten years later, I was teaching, or 20, in, in 2000, I was teaching in Beirut. 
in the, the Institute for Muslim Christian Studies. Half of the students were Muslims and half were Christians. And the, the question, we had also difficult questions because we, we wanted to be clear. I tried to, to say uh, not to, to please to the others, but to say what the Quran says and what the Muslim traditions from one side, what the gospel and what the Christian tradition. And we came at one point and the students said, but the Muslims said, uh, but we cannot accept uh, this approach of uh, human rights uh, because in the Quran there are some points who are against this. I was teaching with a Muslim professor all the courses were given together by two. And the Muslim professor said, but look, what the Quran is saying, if we take it literally, we cannot, uh, we cannot apply it today. But if we interpret it, for instance, the Quran says, uh, who the, the thief, we must cut his hand. This was the only possibility then. But today there are other possibilities uh, to educate someone, to help him not to steal. But the student said, but in the Quran is clearly said. So we have to do it. And then I commented and I said, we have also in the, in the Bible, in the Hebrew Bible, chapters and verses very hard with, with thieves, with adulteries, and also violent verses, but we are trying to interpret them, to see what it means. We take the meaning and we see what we could do today. And so we had a discussion, and at the end, the, the conclusion was, we have to rethink our faith from both sides and help each other to reinterpret it. After these discussions and after two years, one of the students, he was a Shi from the Shia community, the, min the more minoritarian community, he came to me and said, Father Samir, I would like you to be my spiritual father. The word in Arabic is totally unknown to Muslims, the expression spiritual father. I said, but how can I do it? I am Christian, I don't want to, to Christianize you. He said, no, no, I want, I want you to be my guide spiritually and he used to come twice a month to discuss with me his problems and I tried to answer to give some advice from the Bible and from the Quran possibly uh, something existing in both this was in 2000 in 2000 last year the same student was um, in London in charge, the chief of the Shia community in London, recognized by the by Great Britain uh, government. And he came to me and he said, you remember me? I said, certainly, yeah. Uh, you were my spiritual father. Now I would like you to come with me, I invite you to go in Iran, in Iraq first, to see the holy place in Iraq, Najaf, and to discuss with the Shia Imam there. I said, but it's not the time and so on. I had really 
uh, practical problems. He said, please come. I, uh, I spoke with uh, Sistani. Sistani is the highest authority in the Shia community, both in Iraq and in Iran. And he is waiting for you. So he prepared everything. They gave me the ticket and the visa. And we went there. And when we started, it was three days uh, conference. There were hundreds of Imam. And usually we start, uh, the, the Quran starts with the expression uh, in the name of God, the, the merciful, the whole merciful, the, the all merciful. And they came and invite me to start opening the session with a, a word, quarter an hour. So I started quoting this sentence. And then I went further quoting the, the Beatitudes. Tuba, uh, holy, uh, happy are the merciful. They will receive mercy. Happy are, and so on. After quoting uh, in the name of God the merciful. And I developed the theme of mercy. And that mercy means also to forgive. And forgiveness is more than love. And so on. And at the end, they came and say, we are the same. Christian and Muslims see God as the merciful. I tried to add something saying, yes, but he is also father. And this does not mean, as you usually say, that they are three gods, but fatherhood is something spiritual, not, not the one who physically generate and so on. Two weeks later, the same Imam Wissam, this is his name, Wissam Tarhini, came to me and said, now uh, we are invited to go to Iran, to Qom, the holy city. And uh, I will bring you the the ticket and the visa and everything and we are invited to spend a week there. In fact, I went. It was almost um, in, uh, for Christmas. It was something incredible. I spent eight days in Qom, the holy city of the Shia, living with around 20 Imams the whole day, visiting what, what they are doing. And uh, we became so, so friends that the last day they say, you have to give us uh, a conference on the dialogue between Muslims and Christians and how we are all brothers. And there were 70 Imam present. I could speak in Arabic because Imams and understand Arabic. These experiences show how close we could be. But in the same time, we know that they are a confrontation, very strong confrontation in Egypt, in Syria, in Lebanon, we had 15 years of war in Lebanon between Christians and Muslims. Both are there. The question is, how is it that we, we can um, struggle so strongly against each other 
I will try tomorrow to explain why Islam is becoming more and more radical. Why there are so many radical Muslims, maybe 10% of the Muslims uh, in, in our days. We see that everywhere, not only in the Middle East, but in other countries like Pakistan, a little bit Bangladesh, Afghanistan, even in Malaysia and Indonesia. Something in changing in the world, not in, in a better way, in a worse way. This we will try to understand it tomorrow. But what is sure is that we can live together as brothers. During the, the um, two years ago in, in Cairo and everywhere, we had what we called the Arab Spring. Well, the youth in the central place of Cairo, in place Tahrir, the liberation place, when the Muslim Brotherhood came after two, three months, they introduced themselves in this movement and tried to, to say, we have to apply the Sharia, ah, we have to be true Muslims. The youth answered, we are all believers, whether we are Muslims or Christians, we all believe in God. Please, let us live, live our faith as we want. Don't oblige us to do this and that. We are believers. We want to remain believers. And this was common to Christians and Muslims, asking for liberty of belief, of belief um, does not mean in Egypt uh, to abandon the faith, but to practice the faith according to our spiritual feeling. This is the trend now. And the confrontation you heard about with the Muslim Brotherhood, with the President Morsi, is precisely this point. We don't want you to impose us your Islam. We could say the same for Christianity. Let us leave it freely. Give us good advice and leave us practice it as we think better to practice it. Today, we, it's a chance for the Middle East and for the Muslim world. It's a chance for the Christian world. We, I will try to explain tomorrow why there is a confrontation with the West. Precisely, uh, often is because they consider the West as enemy, but we will see why. The question is, now the final question for me is, why God put us in a Muslim country. We Christians in the Middle East, we have a mission, as you have here a mission. Your world in the West is more and more a secularized world. The moral values, ethical values, are often put aside. We have to testimony that this is not for more humanity, this is not the true freedom, but is probably less humanism. We want to be the true humanist, Christian humanist, Muslim humanist, believers who believe that man is created by God, is coming from God to turn back to God. And meanwhile, 
to change this world, to build a world of justice and dignity and uh, fraternity. This is also our task in, in the Muslim world, to, to build together. And the word together is the essential word, to build together a city, a society of believers open to the others. Believers who feel first with the poor, with the, um, those who are un, un, under pressure. Those are our first brothers, whether they are Muslim, Christian, Jews, or unbelievers. They are free to think what they want, but we are one family. This is our mission. That's why emigration for us, which is a great temptation to come in the West and to live in a better way, in a more just way. But we have to remain in our area to change this world, to make it more open to everyone, more just. This is my experience, and this is the last word. It's possible. I experimented it in, I am now 76. I can say since my youth in the school, it was a school, a Christian school, but with 30, 35 percent Muslims. Since my youth until today, I experimented daily that if we want, we can live together in love. This is not more difficult. It's more difficult to live with hate. It's easier to live with love. We just have to look at the other as Jesus looked at each person in, in Jerusalem, in Palestine, in Nazareth, everywhere, Kafarnaum, his city. And I hope, I know that this is your aim, that being the, the followers of Don Giussani, that this is our aim to all of us, Christians and non-Christians. And I pray with you, God, that we remain true, uh, truthful to our vocation of testimony of the love of God in mankind, testimony of the gospel. Because so much has God loved the world that he came himself through his son, Jesus and that he sent us the Holy Spirit, which is God, in our hearts. Thank you. Your wife prepared this, so it's been approved. It's kept silent about certain aspects. Mr. Frank Simmons was born in Brooklyn, New York, and grew up on Long Island. His parents were West Indian from St. Thomas, Virgin Islands, and that's a very good region to be from and raised him in the Roman Catholic faith. His mother died of cancer when he was 17 years old, and for the next 25 years, Frank turned away from his faith and followed an alternative lifestyle of drug addiction, homelessness, crime, and incarceration until he encountered 
a power much greater than all his mistakes, which enabled him to accept a change in his life. Frank has lived in that encounter ever since. He resides in Brooklyn again with his wife and two young sons and works here in Manhattan as a dormer. Ladies and gentlemen, Frank Simmons. And by the way, he married me and my wife, so you know we're kind of close. But uh, you know, I just wanted to say, you know, first of, of all things, I have joy today, and to be able to say it with the drama of life and the way that my life had this contrast today is so beautiful. It's beyond description. But one thing I must acknowledge is not generated by me. So um, I just want to give you a brief idea of what was explained there. Um, yes, I was brought up Roman Catholic. I knew all about God and everything. But to be honest with you, the true love of my life was my mother. You know, I, her love was so unconditional. I've never experienced it prior to being in her presence. So subsequently, you know, when you, you put all your eggs in one basket, you realize at times things can be taken away from you. And uh, when she died, I felt that that unconditional love was gone. To say that I was hurt is an understatement, but who was I to blame? God is a good one. He created everybody. He's so merciful and everything. You took the only one that I, I, I love the most out of my life. How could this be? You got the power. You could have kept her. You could have brought her back. So I, yeah, I chose to do things my way. Like Frank Sinatra used to say, I did it my way, but no, believe me. <laughs> so I went out and did a lot of drugs. And lost everything my mother had worked for, the house, the home, and some people say, where was your father? He took off and he went on his own thing. And I lost everything, 17 years old, like I knew how to take care of myself. But, you know, I just went on because I didn't care. I thought that no matter what, how could I lose? If I killed myself or something, I don't need the worst thing that could happen is I could end up with my mother. That's that crazy thinking that people go through. You know, when you, you're really suffering from things, you, sometimes you lose your mind. I was one of the people that lost track of everything. You know, so I, I wanted to take control of my life. I didn't need God to control it. Look what he did. He took my mother from me. So to me, as far as that's concerned, at that moment, he was just as good as a picture on a wall. So I took control of my life thinking that I could do better. And it spiraled through so many different things. But yet I refused. I refused to acknowledge that he existed. I still wanted to do it my way. So much to a point where one night I had sold my coat, sold my shoes, I was sitting in an abandoned building on the steps. I had no money, nothing to get any more drugs with. And I said, well, I just rob the next guy that's coming by and then I'll just keep moving. I'll get another pair of shoes, another, you know? And it's two o'clock in the morning, of course, like you expect to see all these people running by, you can rob, you know what I mean? But, you know, that kind of thinking. And uh, I hear footsteps. So I'm like, 
oh good. I look around and here's this guy, do dee do coming up the sidewalk. I said, perfect, I got it. As he got closer, he, he was wearing black and he had something white by his neck. And I was like, oh man, it's really getting bad now. I'm about to rob a priest, man. <laughs> Man, how, how low can you go, you know? You know? I mean, I'm telling you this because the only way I can communicate to you is through experience. Not my intellect or all that. I'm not all that smart of a guy, but I can, I can paint this picture because I experienced it. That's something that sticks. So anyway, he comes by and he got closer and I'm preparing myself, getting all rigid. A hot 135 pounds, six foot one, 135 pounds, and now I want to go rob people in the street. But all right, we'll do it. We'll make it happen. Anyways, he got close. I said, you know what? Let me give him a break. If he don't say nothing to me, I'm gonna let him go. I'll find another guy. He goes by, do you know, and he stops right in the corner. I'm like, here it goes. And he turns around. He says. Young man, if you think God is going to come and lay down here with you in the gutter, he won't. You know why? Because he's holy. He said, but if you ask him, he'll come and take you out of this gutter. And I said, man, you better get to step it, man, because I'm ready to jump on you now. You know what I mean? Go. And as he went up the street and turned the corner, and it wasn't far, I said, forget it, I'm going to rob him. So I went running around the corner, he was gone. I looked, there was no lights on and no light. He was gone, and it tortured me that night. It tortured me so bad, I felt, I don't know, I can't explain the word for it. So exposed for what I really was, because here we are now talking about the time and a person and people. I didn't even think I was a person then. I didn't even know what a person was. I don't even think I knew what love was. I didn't love myself. I, so I was tortured and tortured and tortured. Got up and I started like, a, you, you know when sometimes you see in New York a lot of times you'll see these guys in the street talking, uh, you know, well, it's going I was one of those guys walking up a street. And I said, you know what, I can't take this. It's like one of those Wolfman movies. The, the full moon comes up, I turn into this monster, but when do I turn back into me? I'm the monster all the time. I couldn't take it. So I wanted to end it. I come up with brilliant ideas when I think by myself. Suicide! Hey, yeah, that'll put an end to everything. You know? So I'm coming up the street, I said, the best way to do this, now I'm, I'm now all of a sudden I got all these great plans of how I'm going to commit suicide. And uh, I'm talking, as I'm coming up the street, I'm going to go to the train station and jump in front of a train. Brilliant. With my luck, it cut off my arms and legs and my body would still be there alive, you know. Uh, this is the way my life was, but I was going to do this brilliant thing. And as I was walking up the street, I was yelling at God, saying, you're not real. You're not real. You're not real. You have that picture on the wall. Let me see you stop me from what I'm about to do right now. You know, you're all that powerful. You all stop me. And as I was walking, I can't believe this. Something, it cried out from inside of me. It cried out and said, and it came through my mouth and said, God, if you stop me from what I'm about to do, I will serve you for the rest of my life. And I was like, what? <laughs> what is this? I can't believe my skin started to crawl. This is not some abstract thing that's happening. This is something real, as real as I could possibly express, I mean, experience something. So, as I, after that happened, I was in such shock. I'm standing in the middle of the street. Cars, like a car was going by. Yo, man, get out the street. I was like, man, maybe he'll hit me and I can get it done without having to do all the work myself. You know, and he went by and everything. But before 
I got to the train station. I thought of a guy that, the guy last night that said that ha where this happened with the priest, and I thought of a guy that told me, he says, look, if you really get into real deep trouble, call this number, 1-800-WE-DETOX or whatever. And it's just so convenient that there's this phone there. And uh, I went to the phone, it was a toll-free number, I dialed it and called it, and they were like, yes. I said, I don't know, what are you saying yes to me for? I mean, I need the, the answers from you. You know, you're like, what answer are you looking for? I said, man, I'm, I'm a drug addict. It's really hopeless. I don't know why I'm making this phone call, but I'm about to kill myself. Help me. <laughs> I knew that was coming. I knew this was coming. Anyway, I, I'll give this to you real quickly. Um, they, they asked me where I was. They picked me up. They took me to a hospital, and uh, it, it was like a rehab. And I said, this hospital looks familiar. Yeah, they said, yeah, this used to be Hempstead General Hospital and whatever. And I was in shock. Hempstead General Hospital was where my dead mother worked. And I realized right then and there that someone still loved me, even though they weren't present. And what is it that the heart is really looking for? Isn't it looking for love and relationship? Right then I encountered the very thing that I wasn't aware of, and I'm still living it now. It doesn't end. I'm living in it now, and it just happens that I'm here with you, wide open, not afraid to tell you anything about myself, I have problems just as bad as the problems I had before, but why am I different now? Why am I able to, to, to stand in front of the same problems that I had before my father died and still not run to the drug? To be honest with you, when I first met my now wife and she told me about Father Giussani and everything and she showed me this book, I opened up the book and I was like, what? You gotta be a Harvard grad to read this book. <laughs> uh, but you know what? My life, be, all of those words and stuff that I thought I didn't understand, I started to experience. And when I started to experience, they became real. I realized I was a person. I realized that I wasn't the one in control of anything. The most control I can show is depending. And I found the strength of dependence in something greater than myself allowed me to see the meaning as to what the contrast of my life was to this day. So I'm able to sit here and say, yes, it is the time of the person. I am a person. And these are my people. And I'm proud of that. And, and yes, it's, I don't have the answer to how, why all of these things happened in my life, but I know they happened. And I want more. It's not enough. That little encounter, it didn't quench the thirst that my heart wanted. I want more. And that's why I'm here, to share this message to you. We always want to be in control. We're very powerful, unified, especially when the source of everything becomes the source of everything. And we realize that and we're aware of that. We do this together. This encounter isn't just for CL and whatever. It's for all people. It's for all people. I'm in love with everyone. But first, I had to fall in love with myself and value my life. Thank you very much.
What is the difference between an individual and a person? The person is an individual who belonged to a people. The genesis of a people is a group of men and women in search of their destiny. In fact, a people is, is held together by a vision of their common good, but not just any common good. What gives a people its personality is an ideal, a common good is ideal, beyond all the interests and needs to be satisfied that one can list. St. Paul said it first in front of the Areopagus of Athens, which was the Sorbonne of the time. All people seek God, even seek blindly for him. The movement of all peoples, of any people, is a search for God, for the comprehensive meaning of their collective existence as they travel on their journey. Choral songs are one of the highest expressions of religion, the truest witness to the life of a people, because on the one hand, they are the experience of incarnate humanity, and on the other, they are nostalgia for something profoundly beyond our imagination. Luigi Giussani.